last but not least in this session, um, <clears throat> Hora Merrick from um, Vanderbilt, uh, um, who studies both um, replication transcription conflicts and blocking the development of drug resistance. We'll talk about inhibiting the evolution of antimicrobial resistance. And here again, I have a connection once removed because Hora was a postdoc with Alan Grossman, my first graduate student. <laughs> That's definitely a special connection. So does that make me your uh, granddaughter, science granddaughter? Definitely in my lineage, yes. <laughs> hope I'm making you proud. <laughs> OK, let me go ahead and get started. Uh, and again, happy birthday, Evelyn. Thank you for setting up all this foundation that uh, Thank you so much. brought us to uh, where we are. So OK, so the title of my talk is Inhibiting the Evolution of AMR Development. Um, I wanted to make a slight modification since I'm in the TCR uh, session today. It's a non-TCR perspective on MFD function. And uh, a little bit has been mentioned already about the fact that rather than reducing mutations, it could be actually increasing mutations sometimes. And that's really what's relevant to my talk. So I'm just going to back up and say that evolution is a double-edged sword. So the, the fundamental concept of natural selection was described back in the 1800s. And it's been fantastic. You know, we have all this beautiful diversity in the world, but it also is a problem in the clinic. So, of course, we all know that evolution uh, causes cancer. Cancer is a disease of evolution. It can lead to virus variants, which is very relevant today with what's going on with the pandemic. And uh, in, in our case, of course, uh, we're interested in antimicrobial resistance development, which is a, a huge problem. Here, what I'm showing you is, um, let's see if you can see my mouse. I can't see my mouse, but that's okay. Um, so on the right there, you can see a very unhealthy lung. This is a, lung from, a picture of a lung from a, a TB patient where mycobacterium tuberculosis is, uh, has infected the patient and is uh, unable to be cured because of antimicrobial resistance compared to the left where you have a healthy individual's lungs. And uh, TB, actually, resistance in TB makes it probably one of the most difficult to treat infections. And so that's actually how I got into this whole thing, is to see if there's a way we could stop resistance development. So I kind of stepped back there, and I, I thought about this in a kind of very simplistic way. Basically, uh, these organisms are going being, uh, from being susceptible to antibiotics to resistant through a single step. And that's evolution. And so um, we now know from a lot of what we've heard, of course, in the first session, stress response, this and that, uh, that there are mutagenic factors, volatility factors that actually speed up this process. And so uh, the idea really is quite simple. What if we can block their activity and inhibit the process in a way that might be productive in the clinic? So I just want to set up some criteria that we described with Raul Foley in a, a small perspective last year of how you can actually identify what is a good evolvability factor, which mutagenic factors should you block. Um, I just want to say, based on the previous session, just mention that it is not a good idea to try and inhibit evolution by uh, generally inhibiting a host mechanism, especially that is, uh, that is critical for fighting an infection such as um, this uh, ROS attack that hosts put on pathogens. And so what we really need is a specific bacterial target that we can inhibit that will not cause problems for uh, humans to actually fight the infection itself. So how do you find that? What you need is a target that does not have a homologue in eukaryotic cells. So for instance, mutagenic polymerases, which is what one thinks about right away, is actually a terrible target because any inhibitor you make for those polymerases is very likely to also inhibit uh, these polymerases in the host. You do not want to have a target that has an impact on cell growth. So SOS, again, becomes a problem. So what I wanted to mention, actually, which is in the title of this, is that when we treat infections with antibiotics, we're, in essence, making a genetic screen. We're killing everything that can die and selecting, eventually, for resistant bugs. So we want to make sure that we don't impact growth when we target, uh, when we inhibit whatever target we've chosen. 
And what we'd like ideally is that the target is conserved across species so that we can only make, you know, we only have to make one drug rather than many. And so that's the ideal situation. And even more ideally, we'd love to have a uh, anti-evolution drug that is synergistic with existing or new antibiotics. So these are the criteria that one must look for when you're looking to find an evolvability factor to inhibit. And so we came to the evolvability factor MFT. So MFT actually matches almost all of these criteria, if not all. And the way that we came to this was actually through our studies of um, conflicts between DNA replication and transcription. And what we found there, based on the previous talks, I just want to mention was that there, what was just discussed by Terence and others uh, is really interesting to me because the past, in the past eight years or so, um, we found that in fact, MFD increases mutations uh, during conflicts. And then we found that um, you know, PCRA is involved uh, also during conflicts as was mentioned, but then we also found that these conflicts lead to R loop formation, and we recently published that um, the R loop formation is actually dependent on topology. So, a lot of what you heard about, if you take all the pieces together of what we found, uh, seems to come together in vitro. So, I'm kind of uh, quite excited actually to see what we just heard about. But, in any case, we came across MFD, and surprisingly at the time to us, MFD was mutagenic during conflicts. And so I don't need to talk about this. We've already heard a lot about it. MFD binds salt RNA polymerases and removes them from DNA. I don't think there's any controversy there. Um, but what we should think about is that most of the studies that have been done have been done under UV damage. And we know that under UV damage, MFD becomes important for reducing mutations. And in fact, it's involved in transcription coupled repair to some degree. However, what we also need to think about is that when you don't have exogenous DNA damage, it actually increases mutations. So again, we saw that in replication transcription conflicts and people have seen it in stationary phase mutagenesis. And so regardless of whether cells are growing actively or not, MFD seems to be a mutagenic factor. So we went ahead and started looking across species. If we're trying to prevent the evolution of uh, antimicrobial resistance, it's really important to go beyond E. coli and start looking at other species that are relevant uh, in, in, uh, in particular uh, during you know, infections and drug resistance. So what we have here is uh, three different species I'm showing you. So the middle one is Bacillus subtilis, which is our favorite model organism. Um, what you can see is that when you don't have MFD, mutation rates are down. So these are Luria delbrook assays. Um, and then on either side, I have Salmonella and Pseudomonas. Both of these strains came from patients. We knocked out MFD and we see the same thing. So it looks like by measuring rifampicin resistance as a way to quantify mutation rates, that indeed MFD is mutagenic and without it, mutation rates go down. So I mentioned MTB before, uh, the agent that causes TB. And so we wanted to see if uh, MTB was also going to display the same kind of phenotype. So we went into BSL-3 facilities and did these experiments using MTB. And what we found was that indeed this is conserved. Uh, so rifampicin is a frontline drug for TB treatment, uh, but so is ethambutol and ciprofloxacin. And in all cases that we looked at, we found that mutation rates are lower when you don't have MFD. And again, this is all in the absence of exogenous damage, right? So this is the baseline. And um, so this, is, this was quite interesting, but as you can notice here, the differences are kind of small. You're looking at two to three fold decrease in mutation rates. And so the question we had was, um, you know, is this relevant for the development of antimicrobial resistance? And so to address that, we decided to come up with an assay. Do these mutation rate differences accelerate AMR development? And so to answer that question, we developed an evolution assay where we expose cells to a range of antibiotics, and then we measured the kinetics and levels of resistance development. So we did that, and here are some of the results. So what I'm showing you here are heat maps representing the amount of rifampicin that cells can tolerate over time, over many generations. And as the colors get more intense and more blue, that means that they can tolerate more. Um, 
And when it's black, that's you know off the charts and we have to stop the experiment because we can't actually add any more rifampicin into the media. The media would become all DMSO basically at that point. So what you see here is on the left, this is Bacillus subtilis again, the gram positive model organism. Uh, and on the right, we have Salmonella type Miriam, which came from a patient isolate. So regardless of the, you know, whether it's a gram positive or a gram negative, what you have is that MFD seems to actually uh, promote the development of AMR, uh, as, at least in these experiments. So the next question we had was, okay, we've looked at rifampicin, evolution to rifampicin. Is this specific to rifampicin? Just to remind you, rifampicin inhibits RNA polymerase initiation. And so uh, if we thought that maybe this is specific somehow to RNA polymerase and MFD's interaction with RNA polymerase. And so we moved on from this transcription inhibitor to other antibiotics to see whether this function was conserved. So I'm showing you here three other antibiotics that we looked at, cell wall synthesis inhibitors, uh, translation inhibitors, the folate synthesis inhibitor, so completely different classes of antibiotics. And we see the same exact result. Without MFD, AMR development is significantly inhibited. And so it seems to not be specific to the class of antibiotic or the species. Now, this is salmonella, what I'm showing you here. But again, uh, what we've looked at, all the species we've looked at so far, we see the same thing. This is a conserved phenomenon. And importantly, we set up, actually, I didn't do this, but um, my MD PhD student, um, Mark Ragib, he set up an evolution assay uh, with TB and DSL3, which as you know, many of you will appreciate is a very difficult task given how slow um, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis evolves but, um, or grows. Uh, but the amazing thing was that in fact, we saw the most dramatic results uh, under those, uh, in those evolution assays where we found that at the end of the experiment, there was about a thousand fold difference in the development of resistance. Uh, basically, we don't see evolution of resistance to rifampicin in mycobacterium tuber tuberculosis to any detectable level under these experimental conditions if we don't have MFD. So um, what I wanna talk about now is how highly conserved MFD is. So here, on. Uh, the graph that you can see, this is a simple uh, bacterial to hybrid assay. Uh, what we have here is, of course, the controls on the left. Um, but what we're looking at is the interaction of mycobacterium tuberculosis MFD with salmonella type Miriam RNA polymerase. Now, you have to appreciate that MTB is quite distinct from salmonella. They, they're very far in their lineages. And what you see is that in fact, the MTB MFD interacts with salmonella RPOV to the same degree as if you took the salmonella MFD. So this interaction is highly, highly conserved and you can you know, uh, look at two different species and you find the same thing. And what about the mutagenesis, act mutagenesis activity? So again, here I'm showing you mutation rate assays, which you already saw. Um, we have a Delta MFD with uh, less mutations. We can complement that by reintroducing MFD uh, elsewhere on the chromosome, but if we actually introduce, uh, uh, sorry, this, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but this is reflected uh, in the evolution assays. So again, the MTB MFD can rescue uh, the, the function of MFD in salmonella uh, in terms of promoting resistance development. So this is a conserved, conserved activity. And this is just another way to quantify these evolution assays. And you can see that the difference at the end of the experiment is highly, highly statistically significant. And um, the important thing here was for us to get a little bit more information about the mechanism. Is this uh, activity, does it require the interaction with RNA polymerase? So here we're looking at salmonella MFD strains uh, with and without MFD. Um, and uh, what you can do is you can complement that in green with a wild type MFD and mutation rates are recovered. But if you actually try to complement it with this uh, characterized uh, mutation in MFD that prevents its interaction with the RPOB domain of RNA polymerase, you cannot recover the mutation rate differences. Therefore, the interaction with RNA poly polymerase seems to be required for its mutagenic activity. And again, this is reflected in the evolution assays 
Um, and again, if, you, if MFD cannot interact with RPOV, uh, the, the ability of the cell to develop antimicrobial resistance to rifampicin is uh, really, really low, if at all. And we know that this is through mutation. So what we did is we took every single time point and many different isolates, and we did deep sequencing of the whole genome. And um, we here look, we're here looking at trimethoprim evolution. And you don't have to read the, the amino acid changes just by looking at this. You can immediately see that the MFD deletion strains either have no mutations or very few mutations, and the mutations are coming up later. And uh, in a lot of cases, uh, the, act the actual mutations that do come up don't really, uh, are not the same mutations that come up in a uh, evolution assay uh, where the cells are wild type. So MFD is really uh, important for increasing the mutation rates and increasing the number of mutations that will then lead to uh, resistance in this case to, to let's say trimethoprim. So um, the, the conclusion so far, just to recap this, is without MFD, you have fewer mutations. These mutations are significantly delayed. Double mutations at the end of the experiments, which lead to high levels of resistance, are rare. And the combination mutations, if you get any in the delta MFD strains, are different than what you would get in wild type. So MFD is playing some critical role in the development of these mutations and then ultimately in resistance. So um, another question we had was, well, does this impact mutagenesis in vivo during infections? And so what we did is we performed similar kind of experiments uh, to the possible degree because you can't do exactly the same thing during infections. And we developed this uh, very simple assay where we took epithelial cells, we infected them with Salmonella typhimurium, and then we measured mutation rates. In this case, instead of rifampicin, you have to use uh, 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 five fluorocytosine because the rate of mutations are higher and you have enough cells to take back out of the infection and actually be able to measure mutation rates. And so when you use 5FC, this is in vitro without infection, you see the same thing. So in this particular case, again, without MFD, mutation rates are lower. And then you do the infection. And what you see in the in vivo infection condition is that when you recover the bacteria back out of these uh, infections, you actually have, uh, if anything, more of a difference. And delta MFD cells are, um, in fact, uh, they have a much less, uh, a lower level of uh, uh, mutagenesis. And this is not because MFD is somehow sick during infections. Something I haven't mentioned, which I said earlier in my criteria is that you don't wanna target something that actually becomes sick. You wanna target a protein that will uh, not affect the growth of cells. And you can see already specifically under the stress that's gonna matter ultimately in the clinic, when MFD delta cells are uh, introduced and infect, uh, mammalian cells, the growth of the infection, which is shown here um, by hours post-infection is not impacted. So that's a good thing, that's what we want. That's exactly what we want and that's exactly what we see. So what about hypermutators? Another thing that's really a problem in the clinic, do, uh, do hypermutators come up? If so, to what degree when you don't have MFD? So we went ahead and looked at hypermutators and these trimethoprim evolution assays. Again, we did all the sequencing and the mutations that cause trimethoprim uh, resistance come up in this foliar gene. And you can again see in the yellow that wild type gains a bunch of mutations, whereas in the Delta MFD, those mutations are nowhere near, you know, that you don't get the triple or quadruple mutations or you get no mutations in foliar. And so MFD is required for resistance to trimethoprim by mutating foliar itself. But interestingly, because we were doing whole genome uh, sequencing, we also saw that uh, this particular mutation that's been seen in the clinic that leads to a hypermutator phenotype. So now the cells are way more able to actually cause mutations. So it kind of feeds on itself. Have a mutation in this uh, proofreading uh, domain, DNAQ, and this particular mutation you cannot see in the Delta MFD. Whereas in half the samples we've looked at, we found it. 
And this is what the difference looks like. So if you have a hypermutator uh, strain, the rates of mutagenesis are up by two to three lots. And this data is coming from our own experiments at the end. And again, that doesn't happen without MFD. I don't know how much time I have. I forgot the time myself in any case. Um, so the summary and everything I've shown you so far has been published. And then I'm just gonna spend a few minutes talking uh, in the, uh, with a few slides uh, telling you the unpublished data. So um, you can conclude, I think from all of this data that MFD promotes transcription dependent mutagenesis. Its mutagenic activity is conserved across phyla. So again, we've looked at many different strains uh, that are from you know, highly divergent species um, from different phyla, and we see the same thing. It promotes AMR development to all antibiotic classes that we've tested. And inhibiting MFD could be the magic bullet. So we are currently working on developing anti-evolution drugs, and I'm going to show you where we're at with that. So given all the um, promising data, we decided to go ahead and look for MFD inhibitors. So we uh, set up an in vitro screen looking for MFD inhibitors. So this is inside cells. Um, and, and so what you're looking for is inhibition after the, the compounds are in the cell. So we've already skipped that one step, which is important. You want the compounds to be able to get in. We've screened a relatively small number of compounds, 250,000 compounds. And we were lucky enough to identify roughly 40 novel compounds. Um, and we've characterized many of these um, in various different biochemical and uh, in vivo assays, which I don't have time to get into. Um, but you know, we've seen some really promising results. And what I'm gonna show you is, uh, first, let me tell you some of the more exciting things we found that I didn't think we would find. We didn't predict it, perhaps we should have. We found different types of compounds with different effects. So we found inhibitors of evolution, which is what we were looking for. But then we also found rifampicin potentiators. So compounds that actually make cells much more sensitive to rifampicin. And now uh, you have to, you, you don't need as much rifampicin by lots difference uh, to actually kill cells. And some of the compounds we found reverse existing resistance to rifampicin. So, you know, so far, you know, what we talked about was all the development of resistance during chronic treatment of infections. But if you get infected with an already resistant strain of, uh, of bacteria that, you know, uh, specifically talking about rifampicin, you already have that resistance. So how would you get rid of it? Well, it turns out that if you find a compound that inhibits MFD, you can actually accomplish that. And the amazing thing is that some of our compounds have all three properties. So they inhibit evolution, they potentiate cells and make them more sensitive to rifampicin, as well as reverse existing resistance all at once, which is why I thought that this would potentially be the magic bullet. So I'm just gonna show you a little bit of data from these uh, compounds on the screen. So what I'm showing you here is stuff you've already seen. This is uh, one of our typical evolution assays. I'm displaying the data a bit differently here. So on the x-axis, um, you have the generations um, and this is wild type versus a Delta MFD strain. And what I'm showing you is that uh, the MIC fold change during the experiment. So as it gets darker, there's a bigger fold change. And again, of course, the Delta MFD strains don't accomplish what wild type cells can. And then here's data from some of the other compounds. What you can see is that a lot of these compounds have a major impact on evolution. And uh, we've done uh, biochemical assays using uh, microscale thermophoresis and measured binding of these compounds to MFD um, as, as much as we could so far. Of course, it's, it's hard to, you know, because of solubility issues and different things to measure all of this. Um, and we're working on that. But so far of the, the compounds I'm showing you, you can see that already in the initial lead compound identification, we have compounds that bind to MFD in the low micromolar range, which is really, really great because this is the first step of develop, uh, the drug development pipeline. So it's, it's quite promising. And all of this is again with the salmonella strain. And this is all rifampicin assays, but we have other data now showing that 
similar effects exist with other antibiotics that these compounds indeed inhibit evolution to antibiotics of different classes and actually in different species. So I'm not showing that, but we, for instance, looked at Pseudomonas um, uh, and Bacillus and we see the same thing. So these compounds are universally effective against different classes of antibiotics and in different species. But um, I wanna end the talk by showing you specifically one of our favorite compounds. So this compound five is, is really an interesting one. And here's why. So this is the data you just saw. So when you add compound five to these evolution assays, and I should mention by the way that none of these compounds are toxic to the cells on their own, to bacterial cells. And so that means that, you know, again, we're going for that neutral situation where we don't have a screen and, and get resistance to the anti-evolution drug itself. So this is really important. And uh, again, so compound five inhibits evolution, but if you then look at sensitivity to rifampicin, you see that it's a potentiator. So you have a decrease in the amount of rifampicin, the MIC goes down by about two and a half logs um, with the particular measurements I'm showing you. But going again back to the, uh, the existing resistance, we decided to look to see whether any of these compounds can uh, reverse the resistance that already exists or rifampicin. So we went ahead and built uh, strains of salmonella that have mutations in RPOB that are either up and coming in salmonella itself or in mycobacterium tuberculosis. So here are two different uh, RPOB star, it's not like RPOB star, but you know, it's, it's RPOB mutant particular point mutations that have been found in the clinic. And you can see that these mutants are much more resistant to rifampicin. And so there's existing resistance. And then we looked at the MIC of uh, rifampicin and uh, we added the compound to those. And what we see is that indeed in those mutants, when you add the compound, you actually reverse existing resistance. And so this was really, really exciting to us that we might actually have some compounds. And this isn't the only compound that we've seen this with, but that we can have compounds that can reverse uh, rifampicin resistance, inhibit evolution and make the cells more sensitive. Um, so, so this is looking quite promising. And the ultimate goal is to, of course, combine antibiotics existing or new with anti-evolution drugs in the clinic and uh, go from there. Uh, to reduce or inhibit the development of antimicrobial resistance and even potentially re uh, reverse resistance. Now I have to say that the, the reversal of resistance we've looked at for rifampicin, um, given that these compounds target MFT, it's likely that that will be specific to rifampicin because obviously as we all know now that MFT interacts with RNA polymerase. So this is probably something that will be rifampicin specific, the reversal, but all of the other features uh, are unlikely to be rifampicin specific. In fact, our data says it's not. So a lot of people have uh, contributed to, to this work. It's been many, many years of work, many, many different people. I didn't list everybody. We've had so many collaborators and we're currently working on determining the mechanism of how these compounds work. And we are in, uh, at the stage of uh, moving it to the medicinal chemistry and, and hopefully getting to the clinic at some point.